Thanks very much. There's no pressure. Thank you, Alan, for that. Can everyone hear me okay? Everyone? Yeah. Excellent. Um, stops camp. So today's talk is um, a brief talk about um, Stops Camp, which is in the borders near Hoyk. Um, it's a First World War site, but it's also uh, an interwar site and a Second World War site. Now, the Stops Camp project has been running for about two and a half years. There's still another year, year and a half to go. And I'm going to talk about one wee small section of, of the project, and that's the focus that we've had on um, the former cemetery at the camp. So, in a remote corner of Pencrice Farm, near Hoyk in the Scottish Borders, there's a former cemetery, now largely forgotten. This was a cemetery for First World War prisoners, brought to Scotland to be interned at Stobbs POW camp. So this short paper is going to discuss how public archaeology provided an opportunity to learn more about the cemetery, but it's also going to touch on the important social and cultural questions that we have um, investigating kind of recent mortuary subjects because it can be a sensitive subject. Is it just the... Yeah. So following the outbreak of war in 1914, German civilians who were resident in the United Kingdom were rounded up and sent to internment camps. And we know that the first civilians arrived at Stobbs in November 1914, and you can see some of the early ones arriving off the train here. This was followed by captured military and naval prisoners from early 1915. At Stobbs, the prisoners were held in barrack huts. So prior to the First World War, the site was full of bell tents and had thousands and thousands of British soldiers trained there. But during the First World War, barrack huts were built and we know there were 80 on site and here you can see um, what is part of Camp C which is um, there's about 20 huts in that, at that section there. Now by June 1916 Stobbs POW camp had over four and a half thousand prisoners and that was a mixture of civilian Germans um, and military prisoners. The reason that civilians were brought to the camp was purely because they were overnight the enemy, could not be trusted, and they were called the enemy aliens. So they were in one side of the camp and the military personnel in the next side of the camp. Now one thing we need to bear in mind is that being incarcerated in a camp during the First World War, none of these people knew how long they would be there. As far as they were concerned, it would be the end of days. So let's put some in context about how harsh reality would be for them. It's more than likely those huts you've just seen in the previous picture um, that there would have been about 50 to 60 men living in each hut. Um, they were originally designed to have probably about 30, but realistically with 4,500 prisoners on site, you're looking at 50 to 60 men in a hut living, sleeping and eating. But let's go on to why we're here today to talk about the cemetery. Um, with thousands of prisoners behind barbed wire, it's inevitable that death occurs. And that can be from various reasons, invariably from disease, diseases that today we could probably cure. We heard this earlier today um, about breaking your bones. Um, diseases that we can cure today, not so easy 100 years ago. But also from wounds sustained in conflict from the Western Front, and also depression. Um, you may have heard of barbed wire disease. Prisoners suffered for um, the daily routine of just being the same thing day after day after day and not knowing an end in sight. So they were, get, they were depressed as well. So here you can see some um, early pictures of the cemetery. Now, the first recorded death at Stobbs Camp was in May 1915, um, and this was pretty much just after the military prisoners started arriving. Um, the prisoners were instrumental in actually creating the cemetery. Um, they got permission by the British government, but they had to put on theatre plays and uh, concerts and productions so that they could fund the creation of the cemetery. We know of, and I, and I say this hesitantly, we know of 46 burials at the cemetery during the First World War. Um, work is still ongoing to identify those names and dates of death. 
Um, those that can see, I don't know how, how big the writing is for you up there, you'll probably notice there are at least a dozen deaths in 1919. It just shows you how long it took for a repatriation after the end of the First World War. So we have a dozen burials in 1919, some as late as August, as you can see there. The bodies remained in situ until the camp was sold in the early 1960s, 1962. And at that point, at the request of the German government, the bodies were disinterred and taken to a military um, cemetery at Cannock Chase. It's a Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery in Staffordshire, and that's where the bodies are now. So in terms of bodies on site, we do not believe there are any now. So we saw this slide at the start, but interestingly, we, we have very little knowledge about the cemetery. Um, it doesn't look like this today. Um, it's overgrown. There are remnants of the cemetery left, but not as you can see here. <coughs> so very little is known, not many documents that we have. And here you can see, um, I don't know if I, can you see that arrow on there? Yeah. So you can see we have a number of steps there going up on a platform. We have a stone seat this side. There's another one on the other side. We have a memorial cairn with an inscription. And then you can see we have a handful of um, headstones on raised beds, um, ironically surrounded by barbed wire. Um, this is uh, a remote site. Stobbs estate was acquired in 1902 by the War Department. It's about five and a half square miles at least in size. Um, it's remote. Animals do range over the, over the site. So having barbed wire is probably a sensible thing, even though it sounds quite sad and ironic. Um, so because very little was known about the actual site, uh, certainly the cemetery, um, we, um, as, as the Stobbs Camp project, we commissioned a schedule of works. Um, and we are across the whole of the site, but in terms of the cemetery, um, we decided we needed to determine more about the layout of the cemetery um, and to potentially identify um, individual grave configuration. Was it possible, for instance, to understand the placing of the bodies? They did not appear to be in the sequence of death. So was that based on rank or religion or even the regiments as well? Um, a handful of photographs we do have um, suggest that the cemetery changed through time and we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that as I go through. But before I do that, just a, um, um, one of our, our rare pictures that we have, and this is a, a funeral procession going to Stobb Cemetery. Um, this was an area that puzzled the project team, um, mainly because we didn't believe the route that we took to the cemetery today was the route taken by processions. So a team of the volunteers on the project um, analysed this image, you can see. So you can see at the front there we have a band with musical instruments, we then have a group of what looks like sailors to me carrying a coffin and then followed by quite a large entourage of soldiers and quite possibly British soldiers as well. Um, they analysed the picture and because of the foundations of these two buildings and believe it or not this tree, we are able to put ourselves in that position now and know how processions arrived at the cemetery and it is not the route we take today. So we've learnt some um, phenomenal things just on one picture alone. In connection to that, we have another rare document. In 1917, uh, a German captain wrote to the commandant of the guard and expressed heartfelt thanks for the last honours rendered to a dead comrade. And here you can see the letter, I don't know if you'll be able to read every word from there. Um, gratitude was extended to the guards for lending the prisoners their musical instruments for the occasion. So there's a lot of respect going on with burials of Germans that have died. So, Elsewhere in the cemetery, you saw at the, at the top of the talk, we saw headstones. Um, the headstones disappeared following the disinterment to um, Cannock Chase. And so the team were quite eager to understand where the stones were. Um, one view was that maybe they were still in the ground. If you take a body out, you put the stone back because that's the easiest place you've got a hole in the ground to put it. Um, most of the theories of where the stones are um, kind of remain unsubstantiated, so people still can't really prove it one way or the other where stones have gone. So as part of our work, we took a, a geophysical survey, uh, members of the public took part in that, and we worked with Edinburgh Archaeological Field Society, and we did a, um, a 40 metre by 40 metre square um, geophysics survey to see if we could find the headstones in the ground. 
Now, I know it's a, a, fairly, a fairly crude image to show you, but you hopefully can just spot out that we have some dark linear lines uh, crisscrossing over the area that we surveyed. And so that, we felt that these anomalies were quite, we warranted some further investigation. So we did a, a very small um, excavation, um, bearing in mind that this is still a site of um, respect and bodies were buried here for a good 40 to 50 years, probably even more than that. Um, even though the bodies are not there, we still need to show respect to that area that we were working in. Um, a small excavation that we worked on didn't reveal any stonework. We didn't find any headstones. Um, so believe it or not, that hunt for headstones still continues. They are somewhere. We still don't know where. They certainly did not go with the bodies to Cannock Chase. But opening up the trench, however, did confirm the suspicions that those dark linear lines that you saw were paths that were constructed around the actual grave, um, grave markers. Um, but beside the path, at a depth of about a foot, we came across um, a headstone shoe. So you're looking straight down on it here. And the headstone shoe is designed to be underneath the ground, about a foot down. And the idea is that it stops the headstone from sinking into the ground, but also falling backwards or forwards. So you can see we have a slot there where the headstone would be. Um, and that illustration will give you an idea of, of how it's supposed to look. So we were quite surprised to see that and see how elaborate the actual cemetery um, construction had been. And so we extended it a little bit more and found another headstone shoe. And you can see we have a double headstone. It's one piece of concrete. Um, so as we started to explore the ground and explore the records and what, what, what there were, we and all the volunteers on the project started to build up a picture of the sequence of events. And we kind of know that from 1915, the bodies were buried with kind of relatively little funerary adornment. Early photographs actually suggest the headstones were wooden. Um, which would not have lasted that long. And then around 1917, a significant change took place and stone features are brought in. There's a sto the, the memorial cairn, which we'll look at in a second, the, the concrete um, headstone shoes, the stone headstones, the steps as well, were all added around about 1917. Um, but then something quite intriguing happened when we were looking at these, and this picture doesn't really do it justice. When we were looking at these headstone shoes, we have the belief now that some of those headstones and headstone shoes were placed incorrectly over the body. So rather than above the head, they were put across the chest, um, which caused a major issue when the bodies were taken out in the 1960s because they used the headstones as the locator for the body, removed the headstone, hoped to find the body, and of course they couldn't because it was still underneath these concrete headstone shoes. So this would have been an obstruction to the extraction and we have evidence now that they broke a lot of the headstone shoes to actually make the extraction of the body um, of the remains and that would have been the only option they had. So it's intriguing that they later, two years after some of the deaths, they're placing headstones and headstone shoes in their incorrect position. We also explored um, the platform as you saw in the early picture and these are the steps that lead up to that platform. This is what those steps look like today. Um, the focus here was that old photographs show us six steps. And in, on site today, you see five steps. So we wanted to understand if we got different levels of ground going on here, different soil levels. Um, and so a wee excavation, as you can see there, very small one. We found a sixth step just literally inches below the surface. So um, nothing untoward was going on with that one. But the focal point of the raised platform was a memorial cairn, as you can see here. Um, going on the inscription date, it was, was erected in 1917. Um, but while sadly, it was destroyed at some point between 1947 and the mid 1960s. And we say 1947 because we have a picture of a gentleman standing next to it. Um, and in the mid 60s, we have accounts of the stone in bits on the floor, demolished. There's no evidence of how and why it happened. Um, there are lots of theories, um, but again, not a lot of evidence. 
One view is that it was, used, it was blown up. Another view that it was target practice. So we don't know. At the centre of the inscription, you will make out some writing. It's in German. And it roughly translates to, and that's the title of the talk today, to our comrades who died far from home. Around the stones, you can see they are um, they're mortar bonded. So it's highly unlikely that this memorial cairn just simply fell down. Something happened to it. So we've been doing some work on it with the volunteers on the project. Um, the base of the cairn is still in situ situation, as you can see there. That is the base of the stone today. And it's allowing us to do some analysis on the collapse. We're looking at the spread of the stones, as you can see at the bottom left there. Um, we're making some assessments about which way it fell. Um, was it a blunt force that hit it and so forth? And that work is still ongoing now. But one of the key things for us on the project is that from uh, some point next year, and quite possibly for the commemoration of Armistice next year, is that we will get this memorial can rebuilt and re-erected um, using the stones that the German POWs um, worked hard to get there to build for their, their uh, memorial. So we'll, we'll get that re-erected next year. Um, obviously, I, I, I am the Stops Camp project officer, and obviously um, I, I cannot voice the opinions of all the volunteers on the project. We've, we've amassed over 2,000 hours in the last year and a half, which is incredible. Um, but I think there's some common things that we can all share. Um, that Without a doubt, that small piece of land of the cemetery is always going to have a connection to the Germans who died at Stobbs during the First World War. Um, because of the time of year that we're all, the, 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 our date now um, and the 100th anniversary, we're now regularly observing um, anniversaries of German soldiers or sailors dying. So, you know, it's now 100 years since they were buried. Uh, and with that come sensitivities, of course. It's interesting of the generation who grew up close to Stobbs during the Second World War, um, most of those people believe that the body should never have been taken in 1962 and that they should be where they died. So it's again another angle of, of, of debate. And again, what of the living descendants of the German prisoners? What did they feel about their bodies being moved at that point and what do they believe now? So there's lots of sensitivities about working in with a mortuary context that's quite current. So following our work, we're now more confident that we know, know more about the nature of the um, that platform there and the presence of gravel paths around the graves. We can make more informed interpretations about how the cairn collapsed. We've located headstone shoes that inform us about the process of disinterment. But are we able to understand the layout of the grave plots and will research reveal those connections? That's still work in progress. And we still want to learn why the memorial cairn was destroyed and how, and that's still work in progress as well. Something I've observed in the last year on this project is that as the wider work of the project develops, the exploration in the cemetery has raised some intriguing questions, and I've touched on them just very briefly today. Should a cemetery ever be physically explored? Is turning over soil in a former cemetery disrespectful? even if there are no bodies there. Where should the dead be? Should the bodies have been removed at all? I'm going to leave you with one final thought. Um, 100 years ago, the German prisoners planted a curve of yew trees behind the memorial cairn, you can see in the picture. Today, these flourishing trees continue to symbolise transformation and rebirth. So the cemetery may be empty of burials, Yet it remains a peaceful place, deeply rooted to its past. Thank you.